Hello everyone, my name is James and I'm the product expert for Affinity Photo. Version 2 of the Affinity apps is now here. And for the first time, we now have Affinity Publisher on iPad, which is really exciting. But in this video, I'm going to focus on the new functionality in Photo for iPad. It's also a great opportunity to show you just how smooth and responsive everything is on the iPad version. Let's get started. Before anything else, I just want to show you the new user interface, which has been redesigned for V2. It's had a significant overhaul across all three Affinity apps, especially in key areas, such as the Layers panel. Adjustment and Filter Layers now have their own unique thumbnail icons, and their accompanying mask thumbnails are only shown if the mask is altered by the user. The whole look of the UI has now been brought much closer to the desktop version, so they feel more consistent when switching between them. For users coming from V1, you may notice that the Selections persona has now gone. The same desktop personas remain accessible by tapping here, but selections are now generally available from the Selection menu, which will speed up a number of workflows. Tapping down here will also reveal the Command Controller. This is an intuitive widget that lets you quickly access modifier keys when using various tools. We'll explore this in more detail shortly. There are some other small improvements. A tap-hold gesture will bring up the Quick menu, which replaces the previous context menu from V1. You can also access this menu using a three-finger swipe-down gesture. Probably my favourite change, though, is the zoom options now being accessible at the top right here. You can now zoom in, then tap the magnifying glass icon to instantly jump back to fit to screen, then tap it again to jump back to your previous zoom level. As you start to use version 2 of the apps, you may notice other small improvements to the UI. If you're feeling a bit lost, you can tap hold on the question mark down here to reveal all the available functionality. Now let's move on to the main new features in V2. Non-destructive RAW is finally here. After developing your RAW files, you can now redevelop them at any time, so you're never permanently committing your changes. I'll show you a quick example with one of my RAW files here. This opens directly in the Develop Persona, which is a separate workspace with a streamlined set of controls for initial raw development. On the Basics panel, I might just bring the brightness up and perhaps increase clarity all the way as well. Now before I develop the image, I can change this option here. It defaults to Pixel Layer, which is the previous behavior we had in V1, but we can now choose Raw Layer Embedded or Linked. Embedded will embed the original raw data with the saved document whereas linked will result in a smaller file size because the raw data is still being referenced externally. I'll choose the embedded option and tap here to develop my image. Now let's say I decide to perform some non-destructive editing. I might open the adjustments panel, then add an HSL adjustment. I'll push the red saturation up, then decrease cyan and blue saturation. At this point, I may decide I want to change my original raw development. Now, in V2, I can move to the Layers panel and select this raw layer. I'll then switch back to the Develop Persona from this drop-down menu in the top left. We're now back to developing the raw file, but you'll notice the settings on the Basics panel are set appropriately. I'm now redeveloping from the original raw data, so there's no loss in quality. I might reduce the aggressiveness of the clarity enhancement here and perhaps also warm the image up slightly by changing the white balance value. However, remember that I added the HSL adjustment above my raw layer in the layer stack. That's currently still rendering. If I want to view just my raw layer and nothing else, I can disable Show All Layers here. Having the choice of whether or not to render additional layer work is really useful. I've already taken advantage of non-destructive raw in all the work I've been editing in V2. It's a really welcome addition to the feature set. Next, we have compound masks. These are a bit more edge case, but they allow you to non-destructively combine multiple masks together. And you can choose to add, subtract, or intersect these masks with one another. I'll show you this example here, where I've converted some grunge border textures to masks. Ordinarily, once you have more than one mask affecting a layer, they will just intersect, and you have no control over this blending. However, I can now add a compound mask, then I'll select all of these masks and drop them in. 
With additional masks, you can change their individual operators on the layer options. And I can experiment freely with combinations of different operators for each mask until I find a result that I like. This gives me much more flexibility than trying to destructively add to and subtract from one mask layer. I can even hide certain mask layers if I decide I don't want to use them. Live mask layers are another welcome addition to the array of non-destructive functionality that we have in Affinity Photo. We currently have three types of live masks. I'll show you luminosity range masks first. On this image, I'll add a brightness contrast adjustment, then raise the brightness all the way to bring out the detail in the dark areas. The problem now, however, is that the light trails are being overexposed quite badly. I can mitigate this with a luminosity mask. I'll add a luminosity live mask layer to the adjustment. And now all I need to do is drag the right hand node down to the bottom of the graph. I can toggle a grayscale preview of the mask here. So this mask is blending the brightness contrast adjustment gradually out of the brighter areas of the image. I can control this further by adding more nodes to the graph. I'll come out of preview mode and something else I might do is increase the blur option here. This adds a Gaussian blur to smooth out the transition between opaque and transparent areas, and it creates a nice contrast effect on this example. Next, I'll show you the hue range mask. Now, I appreciate the technique is very divisive, but achieving a color pop effect is the best way to illustrate what this mask can do. I'll add a black and white adjustment, then I'll add a live hue mask to this adjustment. I can now tap drag down here to move the nodes around the color wheel and mask a specific range of color tones. To make everything except the reds monochromatic, I might tap on the hue picker here, then tap on an area of the tree. This immediately targets that range of colors, and now I can use the invert option, which will invert the mask. Now all colors, apart from the reds, are being masked, achieving the color pop effect very quickly. Finally, I'll show you the bandpass mask. For this portrait image, I'm going to add a live, unsharp mask filter layer. I'll use a radius of three pixels, and I'll bring the strength all the way up. This results in some very aggressive sharpening, but I'll then add a band pass mask to this unsharp mask layer. We'll see the sharpening effect more or less disappear because of what the band pass mask is doing initially. I'll enable the grayscale preview so we can see what's happening here. We're masking based on edge detail. The low and high band sliders are essentially lower and upper thresholds for passing a limited set of frequencies. Decreasing low band and increasing high band will expand this threshold, revealing more edge detail. Then I can also modify the intensity graph here as well. I can toggle to linear nodes and bring this node to the top and across to make the opaque areas stronger. At this point, if I come out of the preview mode, I can see the final result I'm after. Now, if I hide this band pass mask, we'll see the effect the unsharp mask has when it's allowed to affect the whole frequency range of the image. And when I enable the mask again, the sharpening is now being restricted to a very specific range. It is sharpening the areas around the eyes, but not all of the micro detail on the model's face. So that was a look at the new live mask functionality in V2. Do have a look at the individual video tutorials as they will cover more use cases for each mask. Now, if you're a fan of using keyboard modifiers, you'll love this next addition to the iPad version. We've added something called the Command Controller, which lets you intuitively use your non-dominant hand to activate modifiers whilst working with your dominant hand. You can toggle the Command Controller's visibility by tapping here at the bottom left of the user interface. A single tap on the main button will quickly reveal the four modifiers you can use. You can tap hold and start to slide over one of these modifiers to activate it. Or alternatively, you can tap the main button, then quickly tap one of the modifiers to lock it on. For this image, I might enable snapping, select the move tool, and make sure I have this fire layer selected. To duplicate or clone this layer quickly, I can lock the command modifier on then drag on the layer and release. I now have a second copy, and I can tap on the modifier to disable it. 
Now I'll rotate this layer by tapping on the rotation handle here, and I can snap to 15 degree increments by holding the shift modifier on the command controller. I'll move this layer and snap it back into the center. Then I want to power duplicate this layer. I can double tap the command controller button to open the quick menu, and duplicate is located on the top row here. I'll duplicate this a couple of times to complete the circular fire design. The command controller also works with layers panel interactions. So for example, I could lock option on and tap on this layer to solo it, then tap again to return to my composition. I can also hold shift here to select multiple layers at the same time. And I'll now transform all four of my layers. If I do this without any modifiers, the scaling is not aspect correct, and the origin point is not central. I'll lock multiple modifiers on, which means I don't have to be continuously holding my thumb or finger on the screen. As well as tapping them, you can also tap drag in the direction of the modifier you want to use, then continue dragging past the modifier and release your thumb or finger. Now the modifier is locked until I switch tools, and the scaling of the layers is aspect correct. However, I'll also lock on the command modifier, and now the transformation origin point becomes central. And finally, I'll lock on the control modifier, which lets me rotate around the origin point as well. Once I've finished, I can switch to another tool, which will disable the modifiers. You can also move the command controller around by tapping and holding in the button until it starts pulsing. For example, if you're left-handed, you might wish to drag it over to the right-hand side. So hopefully you'll agree that this is a really elegant solution to making modifiers quickly accessible when just working with touch gestures. Here's one for 3D artists. We now have a normals adjustment layer that lets you edit lighting information baked into a normal map texture. Here I've got my normal map, and I can open my adjustments panel, then scroll down and tap to add a normals adjustment. Now I can change the rotation of the normals and also modify the intensity using scale here. We also have X and Y axis flips that can be applied. Y axis flip is useful if you need to translate textures between OpenGL and DirectX rendering engines, as OpenGL expects green channel values to be bottom up, whereas DirectX expects them to be top down. I will also show you an unconventional but interesting use case for this adjustment. I've got a 3D scene which was rendered in Blender and I've chosen to save out the normals render pass as well, which I've placed. I'll just show it on the layers panel here. Now I can add a normals adjustment and child layer it into this normals pass layer. This allows me to control the lighting information. It's not much use like this, however, so I'll also add a channel mixer adjustment and set the color space to gray for a weighted grayscale conversion. Now I'll select the parent normals layer and set its blend mode to soft light. I can then go into the normals adjustment and alter the rotation to control the lighting balance in the render. This is a completely non-destructive approach that can help quickly alter the mood of the image without using more manual methods such as dodging and burning. The mesh warp filter is now available as a live layer implementation. This was mainly introduced for mockups, for example, where you have a magazine cover and you want to place an embedded document and warp it to the shape of the pages, like I've done here. The great thing about this is that if you place an affinity document or PDF that has multiple spreads or pages, you can easily switch between them non destructively. This is done via the Resource Manager panel by tapping on the document to view its details. However, you can also use Mesh Warp for corrective purposes, such as with this image here. I might want to perfectly align the mirrored turrets on either side of the castle here. So, I'll add a live Mesh Warp. Then on the Context Toolbar, I'll switch to Source Mode. I'll zoom in and double tap over this area of the left turret to place a node. I now want to pan across, then double tap to add a node on the mesh line here. I can then drag it down so it sits over the turret on the right. Now I'll zoom out, and when I switch to destination mode, the right-hand turret 
is brought into alignment with the one on the left. This is of course non-destructive, so I can easily hide the mesh warp to stop it from rendering, then show it again to see the result. The Displace filter has received a small improvement for V2. You can now choose between two methods when generating the displacement map. On this example, I'll add a live Displace filter to this text, and I'll choose to generate the displacement map from layers beneath. It now uses a red-green channel offset method by default in V2, which performs spatial displacement of the layer content. You can, however, choose the old Sobel kernel method that was previously used in V1, and the text stays in place whilst rendering a pixel diffusion effect instead. I found the V1 method had its uses for certain workflows, so having the choice here between two methods is very welcome. While I'm here, I want to point out the flexibility of having displacement as a live filter as well. Ordinarily, using the regular filter version would rasterize the text so you can no longer edit it. And once you've set the displacement strength, that's it. You can't change how it looks. With the live version, however, you can transform the text layer all you want, and the displacement will update dynamically based on the layer content beneath it. You can also edit the text with the displacement applied. I just wanted to make you aware of that, as it's quite useful for a non-destructive workflow. We now have JPEG XL and WebP import and export support in all the Affinity apps. WebP is beneficial for web designers, but JPEG XL is especially useful for sharing high dynamic range imagery. Here, I have a 32-bit HDR document I've been working on. Normally, I would have to tone map this so it can be shared as a standard dynamic range image. However, with extended or high dynamic range displays becoming more accessible, particularly on phones and tablet devices, we can now start to consider sharing content in its HDR form as well. JPEG XL supports encoding at 32-bit unbounded precision, meaning those high dynamic range pixel values can be retained. Previously, the only way to get HDR imagery out of Affinity Photo was to export to OpenEXR, Radiance HDR, or a 32-bit TIFF. These are all interchange formats rather than sharing formats, so JPEG XL export will become more important as time moves on and HDR image support gains more ground. And there we go, a look at the major new features introduced in version 2 of Affinity Photo for iPad. Don't forget to check out the other new feature videos too. There's a huge range of new functionality across the three apps, some of which may be of benefit to you in photo as well. Thank you for watching.